are Latino, we are Native American, we are Democrat, we are Republican, we are independent, we are people of faith, we are people not of faith, we are natives and immigrants, we are business leaders and workers and unemployed, we are doctors and the uninsured, we are gay, we are straight, we are students, we are parents, we are retirees. We are North Carolina and we are here and we ain't going nowhere. From his civil rights and anti-war activism in the 1960s to his support for gay rights in the new millennium, Julian Bond has been on the cutting edge of social change. As an activist, he has faced jail for his convictions, and I can tell you many, many times, most recently for protesting the Keystone Pipeline. As a professor, he has taught at Harvard the University of Pennsylvania, American University, and is Professor Emeritus in the History Department at the University of Virginia. While a student at the Morehouse College, over for, for over 40 years ago, he co-founded both the Atlanta Student Sit-In, an anti-segregation organization, as well as what we know as SNCC today, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The SNCC's communication, he served as SNCC's communications director and was active in protests and registration campaigns throughout the South during one of the nation's most historic eras. And I just told him, I was a little girl in 1965, when he was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives. Interesting enough, Julian was prevented from taking his seat, his seat because by members of the General Assembly because of his opposition to the Vietnam War, imagine. He was re-elected to his own vacant seat and unseated again, and then seated only after a third election and a unanimous decision of the United States Supreme Court and that was the Earl Warren Court that we remember as one of the best in many of our lifetimes. Bond was the first president of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And many of you remember that it was the Southern Poverty Law Center that sued the Klan and won all of their furniture and belongings and gave it to the Raleigh Apex branch just a few years ago. Some leaders in North Carolina, that was NAACP leaders, believed in payday lending just a few years ago. And Julian was so, in, it, it just, he just was so angry about the position that we had taken that he took to the floor of the NAACP's National Board of Directors meeting and opposed this. Not only did he do that, he wrote the uh, Speaker of the House and the Senate pro tem and told them that this was not what the NAACP believed in. And of course, you know that he eventually, eventually we were able to defeat payday lending in North Carolina. <laughs> Julian was a television commentator He's been a writer and continues to write, and believe it or not, is an actor. In 2002, he received the NAACP's prestigious National Freedom Award. He's been named one of America's top 200 leaders by Time Magazine, and that was in 2008. He received the NAACP's Spingarn Award, and all of us know that that's a, the highest award that is awarded in black America. Julian has received many awards for his work in the NAACP, and in 1998, he was elected, elected chairman of the board of directors of the NAACP. He served in that position for 11 years, and I can tell you that he led us into waters that had never never been tamed. 
Julian has been a leader above leaders, especially as a young man. And you know, as he's gotten older, he continues to be on the battlefield. And so I present to you a leader, a fighter for freedom, justice, and equality. One who knows no boundaries, not one who believes that whatever we want, if we have to fight for it, he's willing to do that. And so Julian has given his life on behalf of what the Bible calls the least of these thine brethren. And I can tell you that he will not stop. He is committed to what, doing what he does. I present to you at this time the President Emeritus of the NAACP. I'm sorry, that's the, the Chairman Emeritus of the NAACP, Julian Bond. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. I wanted to be here in the very worst way, so I came on U.S. Air. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here for a number of reasons. Always great to see Carolyn Q. Coleman, a member of the board of directors of the NAACP, and board members Crowell and Gresham, Great to see them here, too, and all the other leaders of the NAACP. And I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce my wife, Pamela Harwitz, who is uh, who is uh, my everything. The words I speak, not every single one, but many of them, the words I speak come from her. And when you're thanking me for something I said, you need to thank her too. I'm glad to be here with Reverend Barber. He's a friend of mine. It's always good to see him. Give him a big, big hand. He, is, he has put North Carolina on the map. And I've been following your Senate race with great curiosity. It's among the most important in the country. I'm curious about how it's going to turn out. How's it going to turn out? It's up to you. It's up to you, isn't it? How it turns out, it's up to you. And it's always good to be among people who are members of the NAACP. Give yourselves a big hand. Because the NAACP is nonpartisan, I want to quote Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein, political scholars from the Brookings Institution and the American Enterprise Institute, respectively. They recently wrote, we have been studying Washington politics for more than 40 years, and never have we seen them this dysfunctional. In our past writings, we criticized both parties when we believed it was warranted. Today, however, we have no choice but to acknowledge that the core of the problem lies with the Republican Party. And they summarized the situation this way. The GOP has become an insurgent outlier in American politics. It is ideologically extreme. It is scornful of compromise. It is unmoved by conventional understanding of facts and evidence. It opposes science. It's dismissive of the legitimacy of the political opposition. They've frozen our government in Washington, not letting our democracy work. Their politics is the pursuit of hatred, the idolatry of dead dreadlock, if their doctors told them they had kidney stones, they'd refuse to pass them. If, if President Obama walked on water, they'd criticize him because he couldn't swim. Now, for all of that, it's safe to say that the racial picture in America has improved remarkably, so much so that a black man is in the White House and a statue of Martin Luther King is on the Washington Mall. But. We understand that Barack Obama's election and re-election was testament to one man's singular abilities and not bringing racial nirvana across the land. We knew that his victory did not herald a post-civil rights America or mean that race had been vanquished. It couldn't eliminate structural inequity or racist attitudes. 
Indeed, there's evidence that it fomented them. Obama is to the Tea Party as the moon is to werewolves. Now, there are those who say that race is history. They have it exactly backward. History is race. The word America, the word America scrambled after all spells, I am race. And America is race. From its symbolism to its substance, from its founding by slaveholders to its rending by the Civil War, from Johnny Reb to Jim Crow, from the Ku Klux Klan to Katrina, from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin to Michael Brown. This is the first fourth year of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, the war that claimed more American lives than all other wars combined in our nation's history. The legacy of slavery and the Civil War colored the state-by-state -state results of both Obama presidential elections. In 2008, in every state that was part of the Confederacy, John McCain won a larger fair share of the white vote than he did nationwide, including almost 90% in both Alabama and Mississippi. Similarly, Mitt Romney won the presidency of the slave states of America, carrying nine out of 10 of the traitor states. But we don't have to go back to slavery, as central as it is to our past and our present. The Social Security Act, signed by President Franklin Roosevelt, to cite one example, exempted farm workers and domestics, rendering 65% of black people ineligible. Similarly, Title III of the GI Bill, which provided low interest home lo loans to veterans, effectively disqualified black veterans, not coincidentally just when, as historian Thomas Sugru writes, home ownership became an emblem of American citizenship. Because blacks could not get regular mortgages, they were forced to buy on contract. The seller held the deed until it was paid in full. One mispayment meant total forfeit. So-called contract peddlers sold homes at inflated prices and then evicted black families when they could not pay. Sound familiar? During the recent foreclosure crisis, today's contract peddlers shunted blacks into pre predatory loans regardless of their credit worthiness. Evidence in the government's suit against the government's suit against one black bank against one bank, I'm sorry, showed that loan officers called black customers mud people and that the subprime the subprime products ghetto loans. As we celebrate the fiftieth anniversary of the Civil Rights Bill of nineteen sixty four, we recognize it as one of the movement's greater accomplishments. The year before, in June of 1963, President Kennedy spoke to the nation about his plans for a comprehensive civil rights bill, declaring, this nation, for all its hopes and all of its boasts, will not be fully free until all of its citizens are free. Martin Luther King called the speech one of the most eloquent, profound and unequivocal pleas for justice and the freedom of all men made by any president. President Kennedy, of course, would not live to see his bill through Congress. That job would fall to Lyndon Johnson, his successor. Johnson was more than up to the task. When told by his advisors that he should not lay the prestige of the presidency on the line over civil rights, Johnson said, what's it for if it's not to be laid on the line? His strategy was simple, no compromise. It would be a fight to total victory or total defeat without appeasement or attrition. The bill passed the House in February of 1964, but the Senate fought harder and took longer. The Senate liberals, with Minnesota Senator Hubert Humphrey on the, as floor manager, were, in Johnson's words, as organized as never before, and perhaps never since. Southern senators, led by Richard Russell of Georgia, promised to fight these discriminatory proposals to the last ditch. The result was the large, longest filibuster in American history, 75 days. To end this filibuster, a two-thirds vote was required of a, for a legislative device called cloture. On June, 20, June 10, 1964, Senator Edward Dirksen, Republican of Illinois and Senate Minority Leader, took to the floor to say, the time has come for equality of opportunity in sharing in government, in education, and in employment. It will not be stayed or denied. It is here. America grows. America changes. And on the civil rights issue, we must rise with the occasion. This calls for cloture and the enactment of the Civil Rights Bill. For the first time ever, the Senate voted on a Civil Rights Bill, voted cloture by a margin of 71 to 29. The fight was over. Martin Luther King would be among those present when President Johnson signed the bill into law on July 2, 1964. Discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin henceforth would be prohibited in places of public accommodation and in any program receiving federal funds. 
discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, or sex was prohibited in employment. But literally, as the civil rights community savored this triumph, they dealt with tragedy. On June 21st, 1964, three civil rights workers had gone missing in Mississippi. As authorities searched Mississippi's rivers for the bodies of Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, eight other bodies were found of disappeared black men, including one headless torso and one body cut in half. The remains of the civil rights workers were found on August 4th, 1964. Goodman was 20 years old, Schwerner 24, and Cheney 21. This exemplifies the freedom struggle in America, triumph followed by tragedy, victory followed by defeat, hope by despair, one step forward, two steps back. We are such a young nation, so recently removed from slavery, that only my father's generation stands between Julian Bond and human bondage. Like so many others in this room, I am the grandson of a slave. My grandfather, James Bond, <laughs> my grandfather was born in, 19, in 1863 in Kentucky. Freedom didn't come for him until the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865. He and his mother were property like a horse or a chair. As a young girl, she'd been given away as a wedding present to a new bride. And when that bride became pregnant, her husband, that's my great-grandmother's owner and master, exercised his right to take his wife's slave as his mistress. That union produced two children, one of them my grandfather. At age 15, barely able to read or write, he hitched his tuition, a steer, to a rope and walked across Kentucky to Berea College and the college took him in. My grandfather belonged to a transcendent generation of black Americans, a generation born in slavery, freed by the Civil War, determined to make their way as free women and men. Dr. King belonged to another transcendent generation of black Americans, a generation born in segregation, freed from racism's constraints by their own efforts, determined to make their way as free women and men. When my grandfather graduated from Berea in 1892, the college asked him to deliver the commencement address. He said then, the pessimist from his corner looks out on the world of wickedness and sin, and blinded by all that is good and hopeful in the condition and the progress of the human race, <coughs> bewails the present state of affairs and predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud, he beholds a destructive storm, in every flash of lightning, an omen of evil, and in every shadow that falls across his path, a lurking foe. He forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope, that the lightning purifies the atmosphere, that shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth, and that hardships and adversity nerve the race as the individuals for greater efforts and grander victories. While we struggle toward greater efforts and grander victories, we are still being tested by hardships and adversity. The rich have been sitting at the banquet table, and the rest of us have been on the menu. Plutarch, the great philosopher Plutarch, warned that an inheritance and imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. More recently, another great man counseled, when the earnings of a, minor of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from the prosperity enjoyed by the happy few. Yet this imbalance is the result of ideologies which defend the absolute autonomy of the marketplace and financial speculation. In this system, which tends to devour everything which stands in the way of increased profits, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interest of a deified market which becomes the only rule. That was Pope Francis speaking last year. People of color, of course, are much more likely to be poor than rich, and they're worse off than their white counterparts. They too are fragile in the deified market. The median wealth of white households is 20 times greater than that of black households, and 18 times greater than that of Hispanic households. The largest ratio since this data was first collected a quarter of a century ago. While white households saw the median wealth fall by 16%, between 2005 and 2009, it fell by 66% among Hispanic households and 53% among black households during that same time. Almost every social indicator from birth to death reflects black-white disparities. Infant mortality rates are 143% higher for blacks. Chances of imprisonment are 570% higher. Rate of death from homicide, 493% higher. Lack of health insurance, 33% more likely. The proportion with a college degree, 53% lower. 
and the average white American will live almost four years longer than the average black American. These ills cannot be addressed by individual or organized charity as, as noble as these efforts are. It may be think about it in this way. Two men are sitting by a river and they see to their great surprise a helpless baby come floating by. They jump in the water and rescue the child and then to their horror another baby comes floating down the river. When that child is pulled to safety another baby comes along. One of the men jumps in the river for a third time and the other begins to run upstream. Come back says the man in the water we've got to save this child. You save it the other man says I'm going to find out who's throwing babies in the water and I'm going to make him stop. I once heard Professor Lonnie Guineer say that racial minorities are like the canaries that miners used to carry to warn them when the underground air was becoming too toxic to breathe. But too many people today want to put gas masks on the canaries instead of eliminating the poison in the air. Too many people want to put life preservers on the babies instead of stopping them from being thrown in a treacherous, dangerous flood. The Civil War that freed my grandfather was fought over whether blacks and whites shared a common humanity. Less than 10 years after it ended, the nation chose sides with the losers and agreed to continue black repression for almost 100 years. The freed slaves found their former masters once again control their fate. American slavery was a human horror of staggering dimensions, a true crime against humanity. The profits it produced endowed great fortunes and enriched generations, and this dreadful legacy embraces all of us today. 246 years of slavery were followed by 100 years of state-sanctioned discrimination, reinforced by public and private terror, ending only after a major struggle in 1965, two years after Barack Obama was born. If you are 50 years old or older, and I see some of you are, it's only in your lifetime that racial equality became the law, became a reality, before the law became a reality, not before. For only roughly 50 years have all black Americans been granted the full rights of citizens. Only 50 years since legal segregation was ended nationwide. Only 50 years since the right to register and vote was universally guaranteed. Only 50 years since the protections of the law and constitution were officially extended to everyone. We're now asked to believe that 200 years of being somebody else's property, followed by 100 years of legal oppression in the South and discrimination in the North, can be wiped away by a five decades of half-hearted remediation and one black president. We're now asked... We're now asked to believe that despite more than three centuries of horror, no permanent damage has been done to the oppressors of the oppressed. We're asked to believe that we Americans now are a healed and whole people. As one historian has observed, the greatest impediment to achieving racial equality is the narcotic belief that we already have. Now, the truth is, the truth is that Jim Crow may be dead, but racism is, large and well, is alive and well. That's the central fact of life for every non-white American including the President of the United States. It eclipses income, position, education, race trumps them all. In this second inaugural address, <coughs> President Abraham Lincoln on, talked about war and its cause, slavery. The historian Eric Foner writes, in essence, Lincoln asked the nation to confront unblinkingly the legacy of slavery. What were the requirements of justice in the face of this reality? What would be necessary to enable former slaves and their descendants to fully enjoy the pursuit of happiness? Lincoln did not lead to provide an answer, but a century and a half later, we have yet to do so. So we have work to do. None of it's easy, but we've never wished our way to freedom. Instead, we've always worked our way. Today, we have much more work to do and work with, and we take heart that so much has changed. The changes that have come have everything to do with the work of the modern movement for civil rights. There needs to be a constantly growing and always reviving activist progressive movement across America if we're going to maintain and expand victories and our vision for the future. We can't forget that Dr. King stood before and with thousands of people, the people who made this mighty movement what it was. From Jamestown slave pens to Montgomery's boycotted buses, these ordinary women and men labored in obscurity, and from Montgomery forward, they provided the foot soldiers of the Freedom Army. They shared with King and abiding force faith in America. They walked in dignity rather than ride in shame. They faced bombs in Birmingham and mobs in Mississippi. They sat down at lunch counters so others could stand up. They marched and they organized. Now, Dr. King didn't march from Selma to Montgomery by himself. He didn't speak to an empty field at the march on Washington. There were thousands marching with him. 
and thousands marching before him, and thousands more who did the dirty work that preceded the triumphant march. The successful strategies of the modern movement were litigation, organization, mobilization, coalition, all aimed at creating a national constituency for civil rights. Sometimes it is the simplest of acts, sitting at a lunch counter, going to a new school, applying for a marriage license, casting a vote. Sometimes these can challenge the way we think and act. We have a long and honorable tradition of social justice in this country. It still sends forth the message that when we act together, we can overcome. One thing we can act on together is the restoration of the principal parts of the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court... The Supreme Court eviscerated the act in last June. Until then, it had been routinely renewed by bipartisan majorities in the House and Senate. Freed from the strictures of the Voting Rights Act, states, including this one, rushed to pass measures to prevent racial minorities from voting under the guise of voting for it. North Carolina passed the mother of all voter suppression bills. The only thing they, that is fraudulent is the motive behind these bills. If voter, fraud, if voter fraud is so rampant, why is it almost never detected? This is the antithesis of democracy, and it must be stopped. Of course, some people shamefully just don't vote. Ferguson, Missouri, a majority black city, had a virtually all-white power structure. From the mayor, the school board, the police force, what's the reason? In the last election, only 6% of the eligible black people turned out to vote. You know better. You want to vote. That's why the North Carolina NAACP sued to enjoy the state's massive voter suppression law. And no matter what, you will vote. You'll do it for Goodman, Schwerner, Cheney. You'll do it for yourselves. More generally, and not exhaustively, we have to fight discrimination wherever it reads its ugly head, in the halls of government, the corporate suites, or city streets. We need to demand that criminal justice cease being an oxymoron. We know race more than any other factor determines who's shot in the street, who's arrested, who's tried for what crime, who receives what length of punishment, and who receives the ultimate punishment. We need to ensure that our children in inner cities, suburban, or rural schools receive the best education, an education that prepares them for the century that lies before them. We need to protect the new health care bill, expand it to everyone, and protect Social Security. My slave-born grandfather speaks to us again. Wrong, he said, for a time may seem to prevail, and the good already accomplished seem to be overthrown. Thrown. But forward in the struggle, inspired by the achievements of the past, sustained by a faith that knows no, no faltering, forward in the struggle. Thank you all very much. Would you help me say it, Mr. Chairman? Say it with me, Mr. Chairman. Forward in the struggle. And how do we say it in North Carolina? Forward together. Forward together. Forward together. Give him a hand. Give our chairman emeritus a hand.